Good morning. So, uh, welcome to worship today. I wanted to highlight a few announcements. We are having an ice cream social afterwards. You probably walked by the tables that Karen set up so nicely with the uh, with, uh, little cute watermelon napkins and stuff, so join us for that. Big thank you to Jackie Hull for the, uh, the I'm assuming the, that she provided those beautiful potunia flower baskets, and Pat McCall for all her work in the garden, weeding, and Todd Southers for watering, and, and a big thank you to Ira Neubauer and, and uh, Jerry Ward for all the painting and staining, and they've been doing on the ramp, the back staircase, uh, doorways, office entryways, and uh, Jerry's two grandsons, uh, JJ and Brad, have been helping with some of that recent work, and, and so we welcome you all to worship. Uh, what else was I going to highlight? Oh, the fact that Carol is on the organ, or not on the organ, I should say, but on the keyboard. Uh, Ira and Jim figured out that it was that the noise that you were hearing last week was probably a stuck C or a D in the upper reaches of the organ, and we want to keep our organ guy, Chris, his wife had emergency surgery on, on her liver, so we're not sure when he'll be, uh, that, uh, they were on vacation, we're not sure when he's going to be able to get to it. But in the meantime, Carol will be playing the keyboard while we await the, um, the fixing of that problem. Um, so uh, that's why she's there. With that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Carol um, as we start our time of worship with some music to lift our hearts to God. Join me in the call to worship posted in your bulletin. To the saints who are faithful in, G in Christ Jesus, grace and peace be upon you. From God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Christ, we may stand holy and blameless before God. Let us worship our great God. Please stand if you are able and sing with me, We Thy People Praise Thee, number 67 in the hymnal.
Let us, let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this time to gather together to worship you, to quiet ourselves, to feel your presence, to hear your word, to experience your grace, to see one another and, and enjoy Christian fellowship together with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And Lord, we pray that you bless us in this hour, pour out your spirit upon us. Help us, Lord, to feel your love, for we are in need of your presence with us each and every day. We pray in the precious and powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Joy will read, us, uh, read for us the lesson from 2 Samuel. This lesson from the Old Testament is in 2 Samuel chapter 7, 1 through 14. These verses are regarding King David. After the king was settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him. He said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. But that night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one who build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Whenever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people to Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, I tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people, Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut all of your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth, and I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore, as they did at the beginning, and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all of your enemies. The Lord declares you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors. I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. So obviously, God doesn't dwell in, in any house or, or, or you know, even temple that hadn't yet been built that David was talking about wanting to build because the God, you know, God made heaven and earth, is, it dwells in, it dwells in, it inhabits the whole universe. And, but we were talking in particular, he, he was talking in particular about a place where he would be worshipped, you know, with a temple at Jerusalem that, was, that, that uh, David was proposing to build, and, and God said, nope, you're not the guy, your son will be. And the kingdom, the, the house that he would, there was two different uh, use of the word house, there was the house as in a physical 
place of worship, and then there was the house of David, the, the lineage of David, and of course we know our Messiah Jesus comes out of the lion and lineage of King David. So in that sense, that his house has been established forever, as promised by God. I turn now to uh, Mark's Gospel, to a few uh, verses from that. So the apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. Last week, we had Jesus sending them out two by two. And so they're returning, giving him the report. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, Jesus said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. When they had crossed over in between this, these verses and there, Jesus then feeds them but we don't have that lesson today. So after that, when they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran through that whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplace. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. Here ends the reading from the gospel according to Mark. I invite you to uh, remain seated, and we can sing together near to the heart of God. Number 472 will be on the hymnal as well as um, on the screen. 472. Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 1 through 14. Uh, Ephesus was in what is now modern, somewhere in where, what is now modern-day Turkey. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, 
he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in according with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his God, good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him, in Christ, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. And that would be referring to God in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Here ends the reading from Ephesians. So I invite you this time to stand uh, and sing with me. Uh, bl blessed, what? No, nothing but the blood. Since we have epistle readings from Ephesians for the next several weeks, I thought I would focus on the introduction to Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. Since we are all well acquainted with Jesus' ability to heal and to cast out demons that we read about in today's gospel lesson, Paul 
starts his letter in the usual way by saying that he is an apostle, someone commissioned and sent by the Lord Jesus, someone who has seen Jesus and, and has been sent according to the will of God. So Paul does not write or preach on his own authority or initiative, but on the authority Jesus gave him and the charge that Jesus gave him. According to Acts chapter 19, Paul spent at least two years in Ephesus teaching and preaching the gospel to Jews and non-Jews alike. And Acts chapter 19 verse 1 tells us that while he was in Ephesus, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and evil spirits left them. And that's very similar language that we heard to, you know, about Jesus in, in the gospel lesson today. Later, Paul wrote to God's holy people in Ephesus, translated uh, elsewhere as saints instead of holy people, the, the faithful in Jesus Christ after he had left there. You know, I don't know exactly how many years. And the word translated saints or set apart ones used, used to describe the people of Israel in the Old Testament. But Paul uses it repeatedly in his letters to refer to all Christians who may or may not have had Jewish background. Uh, and also in the Old Testament, God is often referred to as Lord, but in Paul's letter, Jesus is referred to as Lord, and God is called the Father or referred to with other titles. Now, the end of Paul's introductory greetings are grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, since grace is such a huge theme in the, lit in the letter to the Ephesians and in the New Testament in a whole, I want to share with you several definitions of grace in the hope that we can all better understand just what the Apostle Paul and the rest of the New Testament authors we're talking about when they use the word grace. F.F. F. Bruce says, and I quote, God's grace is eternal, is his eternal and unconditional goodwill, which found decisive expression in, in, the sa in, in time in the saving work of Christ. Kyle Snodgrass defines grace as God's unbelievable acceptance of us, and he adds, grace is the judge of the universe asking criminals to sit down to a meal in his home. Grace is the power that works salvation. We are not only saved by grace, we live by grace. Reverend Abbott defines grace as undeserved bounty, free gift, or favor, and explains that the leading idea of Today's passage from Ephesians is the undeserved goodness of God towards people. Along similar line, Snodgrass also comments that grace and peace are both words that describe God's initial salvation through Jesus Christ and his continuing work among his people. I think F.F. F. Bruce is also correct in, in inserting, and I quote, Divine grace and peace are bestowed supremely in the, self, in the salvation which the gospel proclaims. And in providing this salvation, God and Christ are united. They are working together. This past Friday, uh, Jim and I went to the Ann Arbor Art Fair. And there were, there were at least three to four booths uh, in a section on Liberty Street, which had all the community organizations. Uh, there were at least three or four booths of, of Muslims promoting the Muslim faith. And I went up to three, at least three of these booths to say that Jesus is Lord, and I strongly recommended to women who were at one booth, booth passing out free Korans that they read Nabil Qureshi's book, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. Why did I do that? Because only Jesus Christ is the Savior, not their purported Muhammad, prophet Muhammad. And according to scripture, they will miss out on receiving God's grace and forgiveness without faith in him. 
just like the apostles' claims of Christ's deity and lordship were met with skepticism by many in his day, so were my brief declarations about Christ met. But according to Ephesians 2.8, we are saved by grace through faith, and that faith is in Jesus and not anyone else. If we or anyone else are going to be able to experience all the spiritual blessings that our good God would give us, they are only available by grace through faith in his son Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that faith which unites us to Jesus Christ in the body of Christ. And that's the essential truth that Paul asserted in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, which I'll read again. Praise be to God to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Jesus Christ. Not in Muhammad, not in Buddha, not in Confucian, not in anyone but Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our risen Lord. Now, the Apostle Paul does not leave us into the dark as to what some of the spiritual blessings that we can enjoy as Christians are. Many of them are detailed in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 through 14, which in the Greek is actually just one long sentence. And those blessings include being chosen by God to be part of God's family, two, being adopted as God's sons and daughters, three, being redeemed and forgiven all our sins, four, the gift of the Holy Spirit, five, the hope of future resurrection to eternal life, six, the gospel itself, seven, the various gifts of the Holy Spirit, like those detailed in Galatians chapter five, as you know, like the love, joy, peace, and patience, goodness, all these qualities of characters, as well as referring to the gifts, like the gift of tongues and, and the gift to heal, all those kind of gifts. And finally, the promise of the kingdom of heaven, among other things. And that's quite an amazing list, isn't it? But, but what does it mean to say that Christ has blessed us in the heavenly realms with all these blessings, with every blessing in Christ? Well, I needed help on this one. And so one commentator says this, the heavenly realms in Ephesians are to be seen in the perspective of the age to come, which has been inaugurated by God raising Christ from the dead and exalting him to his right hand. Yet, since heaven is still also involved in this present evil age, there remains hostile powers in the heavenly realms until the consummation of the age to come. The blessings can be said to be in the heavenly realms, yet they are not viewed as treasures stored up for future appropriation, but as benefits belonging to believers now. In what God has done already in Christ, the benefits of the age to come have become a present heavenly reality for believers. End quote. Now, I've got some others for you. Reverend Abbott explains that this phrase, blessed in the heavenly realms, he explains it a bit differently. He wrote, and I quote, those spiritual blessings conferred on us create heaven within us, and the scenes of divine blessing are heavenly places, for wherever the light and love of God's presence are to be enjoyed, there is heaven. That may resonate with some of you. F.F. Bruce explains it like this. He says, The heavenly realms is the realms to which Christ has been raised and to which his people, united by faith in him, have been raised with him. Now that, that reference refers to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, where Paul wrote these words. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Now, obviously, that's, not, that's talking about something spiritual at this point because we are all not physically seated in some heavenly realms beside Jesus, are we? We're right here in Trenton. But anyway, Bruce continues like this. 
even if they, even if Christians live on earth in mortal bodies, which we're all in, they can enter into the good of their heavenly inheritance here and now through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I have one more for you. I, like, I, I really like how Snodgrass explains what these heavenly realms are, and this is perhaps my favorite. He says, and I quote, Heavenly realms do not refer to a physical location, but to a spiritual reality. God's world in which believers have a share and which evil forces still seek to attack. It includes all the believers' relation to God and the church's experience. It is a way of saying that this world is not the only reality. A larger reality exists where Christ is already exalted as Lord, where believers participate in Christ's victory, and where spiritual forces are opposed. Though believers, though we live physically on this earth, they receive spiritual resources and their identity from a higher plane. The spiritual blessings given to Christians are enjoyed in this life. End quote. And friends, friends I, I hope you are all here today to worship God and his son Jesus Christ because you too believe that this world that we see is not all that exists. That we believe in a God that we cannot see and Jesus who we will not, who though he, who, who, though he lived in the flesh and died in the flesh, we will not see again in the flesh until he comes in glory. However, I would say that, that all these spiritual blessings promised to us as Christians will only be fully realized and experienced in that life to come. When the kingdom of God comes in all its fullness, when with Jesus' return and the establishment of a new heaven and a new earth to which the book of Revelation refers, and, and, and that time when we will all have, enjoy resurrected bodies and then be able to enjoy eternity with God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, whether that's in heavenly realms or on a new heaven and earth. In the meantime... This passage from Paul teaches us that God gives us the Holy Spirit to be able to enjoy in, in a, some of these spiritual blessings right now while we walk this earth. And we can do that with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. I want to move on to verse 4, which reads, and I'll, I'll reread it. It says, For God, for he, referring to God, chose us in him, Christ, before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. Now, folks, theolo theologians have argued for centuries about what that sentence means. Some theologians, particularly those of the Calvinist persuasion, for example, think that God picks and chooses individual people to be saved and others to be damned before even the world began, or before, it, before even their lives began. I much prefer it how someone else understands it. He wrote, and I quote, Here, what is chiefly in view is not the fact of selection, not the fact of, of God picking a person or not, but the end for which the choice was made, which was so that we could be found blameless and holy in God's sight. Abbott argues that, quote, the election or the choosing of people, that's what the term, the theological term election means, the choosing of people is an act that is repeated whenever the call is heard. God, before the, before the creation of the world, formed the plan of saving all sinners in Christ. The condition of faith is implicitly contained. Every man or woman who accepts the call is chosen or elect, end quote. Now the quote that he is, the call that he is talking about, I believe is the call to repent and believe in the gospel and place our faith in Christ as our Lord and Savior. When a person does that, they become a part of the chosen or the elect. 
yet God also is involved in helping us to come to faith in him. So it's a complicated issue, theologically speaking, and I'm going to leave it there for now. Anyway, I don't believe that we will ever be holy and blameless in God's sight on our own on our own power in this life or in the next, nor does the Bible. Remember, Paul wrote, for God, Paul wrote, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in him. But that does not mean that we are, that we are holy and blameless on our own power. And I'll quote from one more scholar. He says, the phrase holy and without blameless is never applied to our complete justification before God. People are not regarded as innocent or sinless before God for the fault of their sin remains unaltered, but they are treated as righteous. Now, that's what the theologians talk about as imputed righteousness, where God treats us after as if we're completely righteous because we've united ourselves to faith in Christ. And because Jesus was completely righteous and sinless, then because we're united to him, God then treats us as, as righteous and sinless sons and daughters. If the idea is that, that God looks at us and sees Jesus instead, that he sees Christ's holiness, that he sees Christ's sinlessness and imputes or in, applies that sinlessness or that righteousness to us. And it's only because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross and dying for our sins that we are treated as if, just as if we had never sinned by God, We're, because we are rescued and redeemed from the power of sin by Christ's death on the cross. As we sang before this, nothing but the blood of Jesus, only his righteousness. But I do think, however, that Scripture te teaches that the day will come when we will actually be holy and blameless before God through the process of sanctification, through the Holy Spirit make, working us to make us more like Christ. And that time will come, I believe, only in the next life, not in this, despite, despite John Wesley's uh, doctrine of entire sanctification where he said, well, we might be made perfect in this life like for an instant or something. And I was like, no. No, thank you, John Wesley. That's, I, don't, I don't buy that. Remember, but all this, all this is this, and, and remember that, that the purpose of our being chosen by God is ultimately so that we can enjoy perfect holiness before God and also give God praise and glory and honor for all that he is and for all that he has done for us. All those blessings are available to us through our being united with Christ in faith. As, as Paul wrote in Ephesians verse 1 through 13, 1, 1 13, and you also, speaking to the Ephesians and, and to us as well as people of faith, you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possessions. In conclusion, my friends, it is always good to remind ourselves that we have received the wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit when we believed in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And since that time, whenever it was, the Holy Spirit has been working in us to help us to be more like Jesus. Some days, it seems like the Holy Spirit's doing a better job than others. Of course, we are to work with God. At the same time that we believed we were included into the family of God and adopted as God's sons and daughters, brothers and sisters to our Lord Jesus Christ and intimately connected and united with him in the body of Christ, the church. All of this, all of this is because God loves us deeply. And Jesus loves us so much that he died in our place to, re to redeem us and to save us from the power of sin, death, and the devil. God worked this all out, planned this all before the world began so that he could save us 
and so that we, in turn, could praise and glorify him as God. So let's rejoice in God and give him the worship that he deserves, and Jesus as well, each day and every day. Amen. I invite you now to stand and sing with me that wonderful hymn, Amazing Grace, number 378 in your hymnal. Gracious God, we are so thankful that you have called us to faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray that we might all feel your presence, your peace. We pray for all those folks on our prayer list who are in need of healing, uh, whether of mind or body or spirit. We lift them all up and we lift we lift. Um, for your healing blessing, we live, lift uh, Deb and Deb's son. Um, well, we rejoice. We rejoice in 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 uh, their their daughter in law Julie's recovery from from um, surgery and the Barnes's son Ken. We lift him up for healing of his cellulitis and his rheumatoid arthritis. We pray for Debbie. For excuse me, for Terry's sister Debbie. Um, that they will get all the rest of the breast cancer on her surgery on Thursday, that you would guide the surgeon's hands, that you would um, be with her for full healing from that. We pray also for, her, for Terry's daughter, Stacy, that you would um, be with her for the relief of her back pain that is, so, um, that is, is afflicting her. We also pray for, um, for Sally's granddaughter Kelly that you would keep her safe and sound and the little baby on the way uh, close that her that the delivery uh, would be go smoothly that everything every that both of them would be happy and healthy we thank you for the wonderful gift of life and and pray your blessing upon all uh, those parents and prospective parents um, that we that we know and others of course that we do not know 
We pray, Lord, for Debbie and Al Petrie for healing from her brain cancer, her stroke, and also we pray, the Lord, that this uh, potential liver transplant will be able to go, be gone through, that it will be successful in restoring Al to health with his liver. We also pray for Kevin Pentany, who needs, who needs um, healing from his, uh, his liver issues and potentially uh, a liver transplant someday. But we pray that also for him, for, um, for restoration of his relationships with his daughters that have been fractured by the legal system and by the, the lies that they have been told. And we pray, Lord, that he might, he and, and his grandfather might be able to have contact once again with Sydney and, and Olivia and restore the relationship that has, has been uh, fractured and broken, um, not by any fault of their own. Lord, we pray for, for justice in our legal system that, that you would give all of our justices uh, wisdom and discernment that they, we, that they would make decisions that are in accordance with the law, that are fair and just from, uh, all the, from local family court up to the Supreme Court, Lord, and that they would not be influenced unduly by, um, by, by bribes or other um, gifts as such. Lord, we pray for our country in this time of, of great division and struggle. We pray that you would guide all of our leaders um, and lead them in the paths of righteousness and justice. We pray for healing for our president and for all those who are afflicted by COVID and other viruses in this time. Um, as we look forward to the fall, um, we pray that we might not experience um, greater, um, another pandemic or greater transmission of, of COVID or whatever other viruses might pop up. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day, for all the spiritual and material blessings that you have poured out upon us. And we lift our praises and our, our, our hearts to you, O God, and pray now in the words which Jesus taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Joy will lead us now in the offertory prayer, then we will stand for the doxology. As always, the offertory plate is in the back of the sanctuary. Please use that as you can. Let us pray. Holy God, in this moment of offering, we acknowledge your timeless presence and boundless love. As we bring forth our gifts, May we remind, be reminded of your unwavering faithfulness and steadfast guidance in our lives. Grant us the wisdom to heed your call to worship and live out our faith and humility, with humility and grace. Amen. May God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit bless, preserve, comfort, and keep you. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And now little, little son. Go now in peace, go now in peace. May the love of God surround you everywhere, everywhere you may go.